welcome Jamie Ramsey Thank you to very much. the Calm Tea and Secrets tent here today in the Olympic Park. How are you doing? I'm very well, very nice to be here, very calm zone. It I'm is. liking it. Loving the biscuits. Got some and the tea. biscuits on the go. It's, yeah. quite, it's quite friendly. Um, so, we're going to ask you today a little bit about how you've gotten involved with Calm and what you've been up to because it's been a pretty busy year for you. Hasn't pretty it? mega. And why you are now homeless, which I've just found out from you. Yep. So, should we start with what's been your involvement with Calm? What have you been up to? So, um, I started. I started uh, working alongside Calm, raising money and awareness for them in August 2014 um, when I set off on a little adventure. A little adventure? A little adventure, a little Forrest Gump-esque adventure. Um, I'd been working in London for 12 years, sitting behind a desk, uh, pay packet generally going up every year and the amount I'm going out and just basically wasting my life away was going along the same path and I came to the realization that I wanted to get out there and live life and do something a bit more positive and more fulfilling on a personal level. So uh, I packed in my job, I uh, rented out my flat, put stuff in storage and uh, bought myself a baby stroller and ran from Canada to Argentina, which is about 17,000 kilometers That's by pretty, myself. pretty amazing. Um, so I'm guessing that along the way you weren't actually by yourself. Did you? Did people come and join you and help you out with the odd stint? Did people do the odd run with you on the way? Yeah, one of the... Uh, did you have some friends? So when I was, when I was starting up the uh, expedition, trying to get people help uh, to help and got on board, I was like solo and unsupported, and that was the whole thing. So I was you and baby buggy. Me and my baby buggy. But actually, in the reality, to do something of that magnitude, you basically have to rely on other people the whole way, and there's no way you can do it by yourself. And one of the things it probably taught me was that I had to ask people for help. And so, when you're in the middle of a desert and you've got no water, or you know, it's amazing how you just find people and people come and help you, or you know, school kids will come and run with you, or you can find a teddy bear, which uh, mine was called Carlos, which I found in Baja, California, and he joined me for the trip. Uh, and he was great. A little great. mascot. A little mascot. But he was also someone who brought people towards me because yeah. all, all the uh, all the locals were like, El Peluche, El Peluche, which is the bear, and they'd okay. come over. And so, um, yeah, no, so, and I had friends. I met up with people at different hostels, and they saw what I was doing. And uh, a lot of people, when they found out the charity I was uh, raising awareness for, uh, they all had their little stories. So they kind of, some of them came and ran, just like little bits. No one did big chunks, but... Yeah, people kind of got involved. So the solo and unsupported wasn't really that Not true. Right. So you said there that something that was important that you had to learn was how to ask for help. Is that something that is a reflection of where you were in your life, where you find yourself unable to ask for help? We're talking about running, but what about just generally in life? So I've, I've always been someone who's quite self-reliant, and uh, if I have a problem, I normally just contain it within myself, and if it gets big, I normally shut people out, and then just kind of, or take it out on people, and I, I'm not an alcoholic, but I probably, if I had a big problem, I'd probably end up on binges and right. going out and all this kind of malarkey. So, um, uh, I think when you're completely by yourself, you kind of, it strips away some of the armor and you become more vulnerable. And then you learn that actually being vulnerable is not a, not a bad, bad thing. thing. And then you can actually ask people for help. And generally most people want to help you. It's kind of, we all have this feeling that people don't want to help and people want to stay in their own little bubbles. But actually, people get a lot of give back from helping. So if they help you, they actually feel good about themselves. So it's a kind of a two-way win situation. Yeah. As long as you can open Spend yourself it. up to have that help coming in. Yeah. So I find that massively in the weirdest places in like... In weirdest the, places, right. Yeah, like, wow. So I was in <laughs> Panama, in the Darien region, which is right in the south of Panama. And I had nowhere to camp or nothing. To, I just was basically tired, sunburned, really, really in desperate need of shelter and I found this chap on the side of the road called Avi and his two, three kids and uh, they had a little community, uh, Imbera tribe community and I asked if I could camp there and uh, the guy was like, yeah, it's absolutely fine and I ended up going up, setting up my tent we went and had a bath together in the local lake uh, I, they asked me if I wanted mangoes and the kids would jump out of the water throw stones at the trees, get me a mango I met the chief of the tribe I got cooked for for breakfast, lunch, dinner and then the next morning uh, 
they all just waved goodbye and they wouldn't accept any money and they had like nothing and they wouldn't accept anything from me they just wanted to help out so I do pay it forward yeah you're probably yeah. more likely now if you come across somebody who needs yeah. to remember that moment and pass it on well the travelling community is quite good yeah. that way though I met a German I uh, know an old American who saw me and he goes here's 20 pounds uh, 20 dollars I want you to go and have a hot meal but on the condition that you the next person you give 20 dollars to someone else and you kind of accept the twenty dollars. You go, yeah, I will do that. And then, but it was when I left. I was in America. When I was in Baja, California, I met a German guy who'd run out of money. I gave him twenty dollars to have a night in a hostel, and it was like that kind of the circle of That's giving and taking. So yeah. So how long did the trip actually take you? This particular run all the way from top to bottom. So this expedition was sixteen and a half months long, and uh, running on average about forty-six kilometers a day. Um, and it took from August 2014 and I finished in Buenos Aires on the 31st of December 2015 and then I did the last uh, last stage which I ran from Heathrow Airport into the centre of London. Uh, and I hear you had some pals for the very last bit of your I, journey. I did, it was an amazing last day. I kind of, uh, I got met at the airport by some friends, family, some supporters of Calm. Um, uh, there was about six or seven or eight to start with and then as we moved in towards London uh, we had more and more people come out of the woodwork and like join on and then a high park just in for the glory at the end weren't they yeah it did massively it was quite funny they were all like trying to complain they were all like oh, oh my god and then they were like wait a minute we can't, we're not allowed to complain and um, and I got to Hyde Park Corner, it was like 50 people, oh. and we all put on our calm t-shirts and yeah. flags and then ran down, and it was a really awesome, awesome day. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. So, I mentioned at the beginning that I've just found out that you are now homeless, so do you want to tell us a little bit about what your next plan is and what you're up to? Because you've also just done another little challenge, haven't you? Yes. Well, I say little. Little. Yeah, no, epic. So, um, I've done all my expeditions have been in other countries, so I've run in Kenya, Vietnam, Sweden, France and like 14 different American countries. I've never done anything in the UK so I looked at, I, what I like to do is look at things that people do and, make it and then make it a little bit more jamified uh, or running so I took the Three Peaks Challenge uh, I'd never been to Lake District, never been to Snowdon um, so I started in Ben Nevis climbed Ben Nevis and then ran with a backpack camping to uh, Scarfell and then uh, on to Snowdon and that finished on Wednesday um, and then the homeless thing um, I, I would say yeah homeless is one way of putting it but the great thing about the friends and, uh, and my girlfriend and all that is I have homes to go to I just don't have my own home uh, I sold my flat because so you're home full not homeless yeah yeah I kind of that's a good way of putting it because um, I had a choice of having a flat in London, which I paid lots of money for and hardly spent any time in. Or I worked out if I just got rid of that, I bought a camper van, and the camper van is my vehicle that takes me to my adventures. And then when I'm in London, I just find different people to stay with. And it actually forces me to go and stay with friends, because we become very easy to become isolated in our own little worlds. But yeah. I can now like phone up a friend and say, right, I've got nowhere to stay on Thursday. Can I come and stay at your house? And can I see your kids? And uh, blah, blah, blah. And he actually forces you to go out and interact with your friends. I feel like this is you taking your own advice of like, it being okay to ask for help. Yeah, it's along those lines. Yeah, it's very much. And um, it's also, if I want to be an adventurer, yeah. I have to live an adventurous lifestyle. I think, I mean, I'm not dissing any other adventurers, but they all have lovely big houses. And you hear in interviews, what did you do when you got back from your latest documentary? Yeah, lovely I bought a house. And you're like... So I decided to go down the opposite route and just, I worked out that the less things I have, the less commitments I have to societies and things, not to people, but to like Sky TV and all this kind of stuff, then I don't have any stress if I don't have those things. So I have no council tax, I have no television things to deal with or anything. I just have a life which is about doing what I want to do and pursuing fulfillment rather than pursuing more money to buy better things so I can match in with what everyone else has. So, and a lot of people are like, ah, oh, yeah. so jealous of what I'm doing, but they're scared to take that yeah. jump. And I get scared. So there we go. So what were the barriers for you? Uh, it, sound, you know, it sounds a delicate, it sounds like it's such a dream to be doing this with your life, but it also sounds like it takes a lot of courage. So oh, it's, have you had some moments on the way where you've thought, what am I doing? I'm still, still having them every day. Like it's, um, 
sometimes you end up with nowhere to stay um, okay. friends can't accommodate you so you have to find hotels but every time you have to do something there is always a positive on the other side so in terms of like the dream of having a camper van that is a wonderful dream to have and I'm in the process of trying to fulfill that dream okay but you can't trying to get insurance for a camper van in London is a nightmare so you need to find somewhere outside London yeah. to keep it yeah, so okay. therefore we have to like start hiring uh, places to keep it then you need to like uh, and all camper vans you want to buy them they're not in London they're all in like Elsewhere. Devon and I'm guessing they're in Cornwall in my so, head that's yeah, sort of that, where they live lots down there. There. so <laughs> you're basically <laughs> constantly trying to yeah. overcome little obstacles that you didn't know okay. you'd overcome but. and how about sort of when you when you were running and you sort of were getting up every day putting on your trainers or maybe you didn't even take them off overnight you know I don't you know, I'm not going to you at the end of the day what was some of the maybe more like psychological barriers that you were hitting when you were running or was it just one foot in front of the other and I'm just going to run today uh, how did you approach it because that feels like quite a big you know it's a physical challenge mm. but there's a lot more going on than just you know your feet and your legs and keeping moving yeah I approached this adventure uh, as a job in my head it was a job because uh, a lot right. of people were like oh you know you're just getting rid of your job and you're going off and you're doing backpacking I was like no I'm approaching this as, as a job so I had a very clear work ethic that I would wake up every morning and I'd go for a run and I'd never stay in a place more than two days uh, unless I had to which is a couple of times okay. um, and I just make sure that I got into a routine for me routine is very important so you know I wake up in the morning I make my breakfast I have my cup of coffee I pack my tent away and I get running and I will listen to a podcast or some music and I get to where I need to go and you know you get into that routine it's great sometimes it gets a lot a little bit overwhelming when you're in the middle of nowhere the wind is blowing you just want to hide behind your stroller and cry but then you when you do when I get into those situations I'd sit down and I think where are, where are you like, I'm in the middle of the Andes in South America where could I be if I wasn't here I'd be at a desk in an office without <laughs> view of a window I'm better where I am and that's, and that's all I'd need to do and then I kind of just carry on yeah. running and also there was, a couple of cries behind the stroller oh yeah I lost my camera right in the middle oh, no. of so I was crossing the Andes from Chile into Argentina I, I lost my camera and uh, I looked down when it was gone I just burst out crying and started shouting at the mountains and then I regained my composure very quickly oh. and I turned around went back and I actually found it lying in the middle of the road oh my God. Uh, luckily was one, that quite a nice moment it was a great Didn't moment apart from the fact that I had to run 5k back the way I'd already come into the headwinds but you know worth it for the it was worth it to get snaps. it back and actually just a feeling of elation when you find and the great thing about being in the middle of nowhere is there were no cars to run it over so uh, I was alright that point. That was lucky. Yeah. yeah so you mentioned a bit there about, you know, whacking on a podcast, getting some music going to keep you going um, when you're running. What what are some of your best songs or tracks or types of music? Or have you um, got some weird little guilty pleasures in there? What have you yes. what has kept you going? So on the podcast variety, I would listen it was actually just three podcasts I would listen to. Uh, there was the one called Nerdist and there's one called Girl on Guy, which right. are uh, two people who interview um, inspirational people so you kind of just you're, when you're running you're just soaking up all these kind of positive vibes and people talking about how they overcome problems or how they took challenges and all that kind of stuff which is quite appropriate when you're running yeah. uh, History Extra I listen to a lot of history <laughs> I learned a lot about British history and yeah. it's amazing when stuff I learned is just mind boggling um, and then music it was just dance music it yeah, was so dancing with a bit of rhythm but it, my kind of the albums would change as I go like there's albums I can remember listening to them in certain places and it can be quite then, evocative after yeah yeah so like oh I remember this I was running down there and, and then when I'm running on different expeditions I can listen to the same album and it links the, the expeditions together and then I think my guilty song is the um, Rocky soundtrack and it's not Eye of the Tiger but the other one because uh, no matter you where you're... Like you're doing yourself a little like in a montage. Yeah, well, every time you, you hear that song, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, it just evokes like that guy trying to yeah. overcome everything. Yeah. And it just 
I just get all angst up and start running like really hard. And, yeah. Cool. So did you did you ration yourself for that? <laughs> no, I just put it in mixes and then well, put it on the shuffle, it and it would, so you'd never know when it was going to okay. come. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Bit of surprise. Yeah. Keep it going. Yeah. Amazing. So part of what we're doing here today is we've got a little mini version of um, our Teen Secret Tents, which we take to um, festivals in summer. We come and to, over there to your right, we've got our Wall of Secrets, which yes. is where people anonymously submit their greatest secret, but also their proudest moment. So I'm not going to ask you your greatest secret because no, I'm not doing secret. secret. Although you're very welcome to write it anonymously <laughs> and put it on the wall. Um, but it would be really lovely to hear what you would say your proudest moment is. It's a difficult one. I don't know how... This is a very positive thing, though it may come across not as positive. So, I, in my life, I followed... It doesn't have to be either way. (laughs) I followed what I thought I should be doing my whole life. I went to school, I went to university, I did economics, I went into the city. I worked for 12 years in a job, thinking that's what... I'm not sure I thought that's what I wanted to do. I thought that's what everyone else thought I should be doing, so I followed that path. Um, and then at the age of 34, when you have to turn around and tell your dad that you are quitting everything that he's helped you get towards, and you thought that's what he wants you to be doing, uh, and he actually was really supportive about it, so it was quite a big hurdle for me. But then when I was coming to the end of my run, my mum sent me an email saying, Jamie, you achieved something that all children want to achieve. And I was like, okay, and it was you have made both your parents proud. Oh. And that was the proudest moment of me because my parents were proud of them. I was slightly perturbed by the fact that I was 36 years old and my parents hadn't been proud of me up to that point. But the fact, really that I, that, I, the fact that I got there is probably, for me, a proud moment. Because, and I was also, my dad, even though I thought he wanted me to work in the city lab, he has always said to us, only ever do what you want to do. And he, his ethos was if you're not enjoying something quit it and move on but for us as kids we never really saw that because he worked a suit and went to work and for us that's all he did so we didn't realise that he was quitting jobs to go and do other jobs and or just doing different challenges yeah. Um, so um, yeah that's probably my proudest moment proudest moment is that my parents are proud of me well that's so. pretty good and then maybe one day you'll be able to pass that on one to day. another generation yeah um, so thinking a bit about calm and your involvement you've obviously done an incredible thing and raised a lot of awareness and funds and just kind of really I don't know being one of our superstars basically what comes next like what do you think that we should be doing about male suicide well I think today is a great so when I first got to know Calm it was through a friend who actually worked for Calm Jojo uh-huh. and she invited me along to a house party she was putting on to, to raise funds and awareness and I went along I didn't have a Scooby Doo about uh-huh. Calm never even heard of it and uh, I knew that suicide was an issue but I had no idea to the extent of what an issue it was so uh, it was going along to that event and it was to see a small charity uh, trying to tackle such a big uh, topic and try to raise raise awareness in the way they're doing and um, you know I think there was a path you could see that you know it was slowly getting bigger and bigger and you know that in the last two years is the amount of where you see uh, calm is like it's in top shop it's uh, links are working with it you've got big investment companies working alongside and now you've got the Royal Foundation and I think one of the reasons that I chose this charity is it's not just about raising money money is an aspect obviously all charities need money to function uh, and actually it's quite nice having been to the office, office <laughs> that I know the office is a tiny <laughs> little office which is from what I can tell determined by where the cheapest rent is yeah it's and, not the tent actually no not similar but Sofa biscuits. the money is going towards like straight to the front line but also you know I'm a serial adventurer so I can't ask people to raise money every time I do so sure. but this charity allows me to as a man help kind of save the mail and raise awareness which is as important uh, so for me I feel I can actually contribute continue to contribute to a charity uh, even when I'm not raising money directly yeah. so um, well, you've been doing a fantastic yeah. job and I think you know the big the big the problem uh, with suicide as a topic is people don't like talking about it and it's all about and I think today you know getting young people and all that kind of stuff to to, to address um, 
suicide and depression and mental illness and all those kind of things. If people are conditioned at a young age, you know, listen to the Professor Green interview. You know, if you educate people, then it kind of uh, it prevents ignorance and it makes it people start talking about something and they understand. And you know, that's probably you know that's the best thing I think that a charity like Calm can be doing. Yeah. So from what you've learned about yourself and about life by doing take, by stopping being a nine to five and becoming an adventurer. Do you have any advice for any guys out there that might be contemplating a similar thing or feeling like they're a bit trapped in their, in their own version of the 95? Well, I, every time I'm on an expedition, I'm always trying to think up ways to, to condense what I've learned or what I'm doing into, like, words. And, like, <laughs> I, I, and it's, all, it's all corny and all that kind of stuff. But you know, in the old days, I was pursuing money. That was my objective in life, was to get more money. Uh, now I turn that round and I'm now pursuing fulfillment because uh, fulfillment makes you happy and can actually most of the time you want to do it in a constructive way so you're helping other people um, so I would say follow uh, follow fulfillment rather than money um, I think the words I live by now are like things like uh, inspiration motivation determination because um, if you have those things then you can pretty much conquer anything and I think you know we need to we need to inspire young children we need to motivate them in the right way and we need to give them the purpose of what they're doing because I think if people don't have purpose then they're just gonna languish um, and I think people just need they don't need to be told what to do they just need to be given the guidance to help them get to where they want to be so you know. I think that's pretty wise words. Um, what comes next for you? What's happening next? Have you got an expedition booked? I know you've just finished doing the yeah. doing your the Jamie version of the three things. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is um, I when I'm running, one of the things I do is think about all the other things I want to do, and I have a list which is so long yeah. of different things I want to do. So um, what I'm thinking of doing next is writing down like five or six different expeditions and I'm just going to put them up on the internet and I'm going to let people choose what expedition I go on next. So Perhaps I think so things it. like uh, I'd like to go and do the GR20 in Corsica or I'd like to go and do um, run the Outer Hebrides which involves a bit of swimming. Um, there's all these different expeditions, but I can't decide what I want to do. Okay. So I'm going to get other people to decide uh -huh. and uh, go out and I'll make a video and I'll share that and we'll see and where it goes. Yeah. So you've gone from 9 to 5 to adventurer, That's not homeless, you're home full. That's the way, yeah. Thanks for talking to us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate.